I'm here to talk to you about the Blueprint 4, a secure drip plate platform uh, and build process with Composer. And I'm going to get it out there to start with. Um, if you're not using Composer with Drupal 8, then you're doing it wrong, in my opinion. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to back that up, some claims. Uh, but first of all, I'm going to tell you about myself. Uh, Lee Rollins is my name. I'm LA Rollins on Drupal.org. Um, for people who are in, have seen me before, apologies for this, but uh, I've been doing this, this is now my ninth year of Drupal. I was involved in about nearly 500 issues in Drupal 8. I maintain four modules in core and about 40 country projects. I'm on the security team and in the day I work for previous Nexus as a senior Drupal developer. So we're going to do a bit about Composer basics here. Now Composer is not new. Um, if you've been to a few Drupal conferences before, even back as far as uh, DrupalCon Sydney in 2013, one of my colleagues Josh did a session on it right back then, so that's only four years ago now. But um, can I have just a show of hands who is familiar with Composer? Right, now who would use it on a daily basis? Okay, well that's a lot. So some of this is going to be um, a little bit boring in the early stage, because I'm just going to go over some basics for people who are not familiar with it, um, but then we'll get into some more Drupal specific stuff. So Composer is a, is a PHP package manager. Um, if you're familiar with JavaScript, it's, it's like NPM for JavaScript or uh, Bundler for Ruby. I could give you a mix for Elixir. There's every, every programming language has got a package manager. Um, and it starts with Composer.json. So in this file, you nominate what packages your project depends on and a version constraint. You can also nominate auto-loading, so that tells Composer where your domain code lives and what namespace it's in, and then that way, if you're using that code in any of your code base, it can be auto-loaded. Uh, you can nominate development-only dependencies, so you can put things like your testing frameworks in there, and you can tell it what directories to put things in. Um, by default, everything goes in vendor, but you can configure that so that, for example, Drupal modules end up in a particular place. Composer.lock is the artifact that you get out of running Composer require to add a package or Composer update to update a package, and it is your manifest of what you've got in your project. So it gives you repeatable builds. It keeps a hash of what version you've used. So if you nominate a version constraint and it installs a particular version, that composer.lock, you commit that and that gives you a repeatable build because anyone else who has that lock file that runs composer install will get the exact same version of you. So it's very important. So basic usage to add a dependency, you use composer require, you give the namespace and package name and you give a version constraint. Uh, the version constraints follow semver, so the first one on here is uh, saying that I want anything that's compatible with 1.2, so that will go all the way up to you know, 1.44, whatever, but it won't get, take you to 2.0 automatically, uh, so that you maintain backwards compatibility with that. Um, so if the package that you're using um, is doing it correctly, uh, in theory, you can continuously update and get the new version of that package without it breaking your code. The next one is the carrier operator 1.2.0, and that basically says I want anything compatible with 1.2.0, but starting from 1.2.0. So, for example, if you're working with a module and you know that you know up until alpha 11 there was a bug, and you want anything above alpha 11, you can use the carrier operator to say you know, maintain, maintain semver, but start from this particular point. Um, you can use dev dash and then a branch name. So, if you want to track master branch, you'd use dev dash master. Now, as you probably know, that means you can get a different commit each time, and that's where the lock comes in. Because when you run Composer uh, Require or you run Composer Update, it'll keep track of the specific commit, and that way, next person runs it. They won't get the latest version of Dead Master, they'll get the version that you um, ran when you first did it. You can use a specific number. Uh, if you do that, though, you're making sort of opening yourself up to compatibility issues. For example, if you say, you know, you only want. Um, particular branch of something and one of the dependencies that's a dependency three or four layers down the track requires you know a different version you can end up with breaking things so where you can try and use the first two um, and then you can also pin to a specific commit in the composer.json but if you're using a log file you, you don't need that so when you've got a project and you've uh, cloned the repo and it's got a composer.lock in it if you run composer install and I recommend use prefer dist uh, it'll give you exactly what the previous person who you know, added those dependencies uh, received. And the preferred is what that does is um, it will fetch tarballs of those versions from GitHub, from release nodes in GitHub. 
if uh, your alternative is preferred source, and that will clone every single dependency, which obviously, uh, I mean, the joke is, you know, I used Composer and downloaded the internet, and that's what you can end up with. But there is a place for preferred source. For example, if you're working on a project, and as part of that you're working on a country module, and you know you want to be pushing changes to the Drupal.org repo, then having a source version of it inside your project, you know, like a sub-module, is, is useful. So when the time comes to update, you can run Composer Update, and that will update everything in your um, project but satisfying your version constraints. So if you're using Zemvir, it shouldn't break things. Um, but you can be specific, so you can say I want it to update everything in Drupal slash core, or you can say Drupal slash everything. And you should always use with dependencies, and I don't know why it's not the default, but for example, if Drupal core, when we had a security update come out for Guzzle, there was a security in the third, uh, security vulnerability in the Guzzle library. If you ran it without the minus, minus with dependencies, you wouldn't get the Guzzle update because you'd only get the latest Drupal. What that does, it, it gets the composer.json from the update, combines the two and gets the updates for there as well. So I, I think it should be default um, and you should always use that. Uh, one little known command is composer outdated. And when you run this, this will give you a list of packages that are in your code base that are no longer supported. Um, we'll talk a little bit more later about no longer, what no longer supported means. But for example, if you run this against, and you've got PHP unit in your code base, it'll, if you've got like 4.8, it'll say, you know, 4.8 isn't supported anymore, upgrade to the 5 series, um, and, and obviously 6 is their major version. So for the Drupal part of it, um, you should start with a template, and you can use Composer Create Project for that. Uh, and there's a Drupal Composer project. And um, what that gives you is a lot of things pre-configured. And one of the biggest things that it gives you is the Drupal.org Packagist. So Packagist is the database that backs Composer. So if you say, you know, Composer require symphony slash YAML, that goes off and talks to Packagist.org and you know, it tells it the metadata about where you find the repository for that and the versions available. Uh, Drupal, when we first started using Composer for Drupal 8, module maintainers would have to create their own account on Packagist and maintain a record for each of their country projects if they wanted them to work with Composer. And of course, you know, the community iterated on this and now Drupal.org supports this natively. So the project module on Drupal has, um, on Drupal.org, it like auto-generates Composer.json um, files for your, any project that's on Drupal.org. So if you have this uh, Composer config, repositories, um, which you get for free out of this template. Um, you can say Composer require Drupal slash a module, and um, if your project's a Drupal 8 project, it'll know tilde 2.0 means you know 8.x 2.0. So that, that's a great bit of um, a feature that they've rolled out from the Drupal Association, and you know we'll talk a little bit later about how it's implemented, but it, it is open for extension, so you know we as Drupal contributors can help improve that and add more information to it. And I'll show in a little while why I think that's important. Um, so Composer has a lot of plugins in it, and most of those are included in this template that I talked about earlier. Um, and one of them is Composer Installers. And what Composer Installers does is help you put things in particular folders. So if you add Composer Require, Composer Installers, tilde one, or you already have it set up via the template, when you um, is that readable, people? Yeah. Um, what it basically lets you do, um, you can nominate where a type of package goes. So this is the type here, slash core, or type dash module. Um, sorry, this is a specific package, and this is a type of package. And you can nominate where they live in your code base. So by default, Composer puts things in slash vendor, but obviously Drupal modules and themes need to go in a particular place. Uh, another uh, plugin that I highly recommend is Composer Patches. And so if you're familiar with Drush Make, you would normally put um, a list of patches for a project in that after the name of the projects. Um, so this uh, plugin, what it lets you do is have a section in your composer.json and extra that's patches. And so on the left hand side you give, well first you, you name the package in the namespace and then you uh, can name what it's for. So someone interrogating that file can, you know, easily understand what you've uh, added that patch for, and then you, on the right-hand side you provide a URL to the file. Now that can be HTTP, but it can also be you know, dot slash patches, and you can have the patches in your repository if it's something that there's no point you know, contributing. So the title of this session was about uh, secure build processes. What has this got to do with security? Um, 
Well, let's talk a little about audits. One of the services we provide at Previous Next is security audits of code bases. So um, we, you know, people come to us and say, okay, we've got this site, can you just have a look over it and make sure that it's you know, doing the right things in terms of practice, etc." And one element of that is obviously security. Um, now, Previous Next, we've got two team members that are on the uh, Drupal security team. That's myself and Ben Doherty, who's around here today. Um, and so part of that audit process, the first thing we will do is um, to, like, to find, find out if the site's running in secure versions. Now, you could do that in Drupal 7, and you can still do a Drupal 8 with Drush. You can run Drush up C minus minus security only, and that'll list out things that are, that are out of date security-wise. Um, but another step in the process is to, to uh, determine if anything's been modified. So, um, you know, you can run Drush up C security only, and, and uh, it'll tell you if, if you've got out of date modules, but what it won't tell you is if um, someone's actually modified a module. And so, you know, you may, not, you may think you're running 2.1 of a particular module, but you might be running 2.1 and with half a dozen hacks that somebody decided were really good. Um, and so now that we have third-party code in Drupal Core, this increases tenfold. So uh, anyone have, want to have a guess at how much, in terms of megabytes, there is in uh, the vendor folder in Drupal 8, code-wise? Yeah. No takers. Yeah. Yeah, there's 58 meg in vendor, and there's 68 meg in app core alone. That doesn't include, um, that doesn't include any contrary projects. So you've got 130 meg of code to audit, if you want to make sure that no, that's been modified, if you check all of these things into your repository, right? So the audit surface is huge. Now there's a module in Drupal 7 called Hacked, and you can run that, and what it does is in your temporary folder, it'll download the Drupal.org canonical version of each of the modules you've got on, stored on the site, and then run a diff and tell you if people have actually modified stuff. But, you know, if you're talking about 130 plus maybe 20 meg of um, contrib code, you know, it's a lot of code to check over. Um, and there's a, yeah. Right, so so it's not perfect either. That's yeah. good because I'm not I'm not saying it's the answer, but I'm just I'm just pointing out that there is some ways to do this, but I don't think there is as as good as Composer. Um, and there's an old saying in the Drupal community: every time you hack core, a kitten gets killed. And so when we order the site, you know, it's not uncommon to find modified code in core or modified code in a module, and we look for patches if there is, because I mean, core has thousands of bugs. I'm, I think there's like 11,000 open issues against Drupal Core. So patching is reality. You know, if, if you've got a particular thing that's broken your site and you search the issue queue and you find a patch, you know, you're going to use it on your site. And if you keep that patch, then you're not really hacking Core because, you know, you've got a record that you can replay of how to reinstate those changes. Um, because if you don't have patches, well, good luck with the critical security update. And I know that everyone here will have worked on a site where there was some particular modification and they couldn't apply a security update immediately because it would have broken some customization. If you have a patch for that, you can update smoothly. Um, you don't have really any snowflake changes. And you know, if you put that patch on Drupal.org, you know, the new version comes out with a security update and it doesn't apply, you're, you're not alone there. Someone else is going to be in the same boat. So either you re-roll it or someone else re-rolls it. But you know, as a community, um, we get to that pretty quickly. And so f something like um, you know, Drupal Geddon, if, if you, as you know, if you didn't apply patches in sort of seven hours, you know, automated scans, um, you know, going across the internet, compromising sites. So if you've got a patch, you're, you're probably okay. But if you take contrib and core and any contrib themes and any vendor code out of your repo, what do you have left? Well, all you have left your theme and your modules that you've written that are custom. So when you come to audit something, that's all you've got left. So instead of a 130 meg audit surface, you've basically got that custom code and custom themes. Um, and so your new, secure, your new audit process is just to check for insecure module versions. Now, as I said, you can run Drush Up C security only dry run, for example, but you can also um, use Composer. You can just go Composer Show, minus minus installed, and that'll list everything that your site's running, including vendor code, and you can um, you know, have a look at stuff that's in alpha or dev or alpha or beta, and you know it isn't covered by the security team. Asterix, I'll come back. <laughs> but um, yeah, if you are running an alpha version or a beta version, or a RC, for example, um, 
there isn't coverage from the security team. Now, the security team coverage doesn't mean the security team audits the code in a stable module, but what it does mean is that if there is a security issue, then it's handled in the private queue. And so if you use a dev alpha beta version, and that's a reality, particularly if you're using Drupal 8, but there's a lot of Drupal 7 modules that never got stable releases, I think you need to look for some other signs, like you need to check the maintainer's reputation. Um, and if there was a session earlier uh, in the room over there about, um, are we, you know, can we use Drupal 8, and they talked about that I think a quarter of the modules that are running on a particular site weren't stable, but they found that a lot of the alpha versions were you know, rock solid already. Um, so if you do use those alpha, dev, beta, etc., cetera, um, it's a good idea to follow the issue queue for that so that if there are issues that are open in public that are security, then at least you're aware of them and you can help or you can at least you know, take mitigating steps. And I said asterisks before because I wrote this presentation four weeks ago and, and two weeks ago the rug was pulled out from underneath my feet because you may or may not know now that the security coverage for contributor projects is now opt-in. So um, we used to have the whole peer review process to become a git vetted user before you could publish modules on Drupal.org and that was basically a bottleneck. There were thousands of contributors who wanted to contribute but couldn't because they couldn't find someone to review and vet their application. So as a community we decided to do something about it and what we decided to do about it was open the gates for that um, and then if you wanted to receive security team um, coverage for your module you had to tick a box and say yes I want to opt in and then um, you know, that you'd go through that review process then. Now, what that means now is there two, there's two um, flavours of a stable module. There's a stable module that has security team coverage and there's a stable module that doesn't. And there's a big warning across the top of the project page, but if, if I mean, I don't regularly visit project pages, I normally use Composer to download stuff. So, um, this week, this is literally this week, I've, I've opened this issue, so the one at the bottom, um, so, like I was saying before, the code that's on Drupal.org that automatically generates these composer.json files for projects so that Drupal um, projects are discoverable from the composer binary, uh, it adds a lot of metadata and it, it's kind of building that, you know, dynamically. There isn't actually a composer.json file on disk. It's built and it's served um, as though there is. So we can add extra information to that. And as you saw before, there's that extra key in the composer.json. So the second issue of this adds a flag to that, security coverage, yes or no. Um, and then the one above it is, uh, and this is like, I literally started this on Friday because this has only just changed this last week. Um, it's a Composer plugin that I'm writing for Composer that you can add so that if you do install or you do run a command, you can see if you do have outdated stuff. That's very, very early. Um, I'm waiting for the, the support to come in our Composer.json, but the Drupal Association, they've you know said they're supporting that. so. It will get there, just like everything, it takes a bit of time. Um, but this raises a question around like, what you've notionally probably had in the past of a vetted module list. Um, Composer has something that's got a minimum stability flag. So if you're composer.json, you say minimum stability stable, it won't let you install RC or dev or beta or dev um, or alpha versions, it, it will, like when you go to run install, it will say, sorry, we couldn't find a, a set of packages to resolve what you require. Now, as I said before, this change breaks that, and that's unfortunate, but I'm hoping that my plugin will reinforce this. And so if you've said minimum stability is stable, and you attempt to install a Drupal module, and that module um, doesn't have security team buy-in, that uh, you'll be able to configure it to say, okay, I know, but you at least have to opt in to get past that. So. Um, yeah, three weeks ago, that's the, I didn't have this slide, uh, this slide, wherever gone, but two weeks ago I, did, yeah, I have to add it in. Um, so but with this stable, you can, you can put in there uh, dev, alpha, beta, and RC, so you can like vary it up or down, um, but yeah, the default is stable, um, and obviously if you're building stuff in Drupal, you probably want to change that if you're relying on modules that, that are still in development. So I said before about out-of-date third-party code. Well, this isn't limited to securities, but you can run Composer outdated, and that'll tell you projects that are no longer supported. <coughs> and as I said, this doesn't tell you what has a security update in your third-party library, so I'm talking about things like Guzzle or Symfony components. But there is a, uh, a Sensio Labs um, security tool for that. So basically, you've got your composer.log from your install process, and you can visit security.senseolabs.org, and you can upload your composer.log. 
and it'll give you a report of any insecure projects that you're running where there's a common vulnerability um, being issued for that particular project. So as I said before, always check in your lock file because if you don't have that, then I mean, you can't use tools like this. And thankfully, there's also tooling for this. So I mean, I'm assuming everyone here has an automated build process, but if you don't, come talk to us because that's the stuff we do. But um, if you use this uh, Sensei Lab Security Checker, you build that into your tooling process and as part of your build process, um, you can just run Security Checker, um, the second line here. Uh, so the first one's to install it, the second one's to run it, bin Security Checker, Security Check, and path to your composer.lock, and that will um, fail if you've got insecure versions in your composer.lock. And how does it work? Well, there's a GitHub repository called Friends of PHP Security Advisories. It's an open source database of all CVEs, so common vulnerabilities and exposures. So when Drupal has a security um, advisory, we apply to this uh, MITRE and they give us an ID for the security vulnerability and that's like a common uh, database of vulnerabilities right across the software ecosystem. And so this one compiles all of the PHP ones. Um, does it include Drupal? For core it does, yes but it doesn't um, include uh, country projects yet. Um, so the security team is working on moving the security advisory um, notifications that you see on Drupal.org from a forum post that they are now to their own node type. Once they become their own node type, then we can automate generating pull requests against that repository so that they're automatically filed. Um, so for something more formal, not all PHP projects are created equal. So for the Drupal process, for example, uh, most people, if they find something, there's a little link on the side of the project, report a security issue that goes into the private queue and it's dealt with, you know, and then we have the whole disclosure process through the security advisories. Um, Symphony, they create a private repo per issue and they assign a team to that repo and they work on it in private. But there is no common formalised reporting process across PHP projects and there's no common disclosure process. PSR 9 and 10 are to address that. So one of them is around um, the process for reporting and the other one is around the process for um, publishing. They're both stalled at the moment and as you're probably aware, the PHP Framework Interoperability Group, who are the people that um, propose and uh, ratify these PSRs, which are PHP standard recommendations, they had a, like a mini implosion uh, just recently and they sort of rebooted with a new approach and a new sort of um, executive and a new way of doing it, but these two still haven't kicked back off, but uh, Michael Hess, the security team lead, he's been actively involved in these and we're looking to get them going again. I don't know whether last week's um, events will impact on that, because obviously uh, that has a big bearing on Drupal's representation at the Framework Interoperability Group. But yeah, hopefully, um, you know, with time we'll get to a point where all PHP projects use the same process for reporting security issues and for dealing with it in private, and then all PHP projects projects have a similar process for um, publishing those and making them available for people to search. Okie dokie, that's all I've got. Um, that's the link to the Drupal.org documentation about using the template, and it's very thorough. Um, as I said, I'm always available on Drupal AU in IRC. I've been there for the last nine years. Some people here have talked to me the last nine years. And finally, I've got to thank the State Library of Queensland for all of their excellent photos. Um, I've got a huge repository of public domain images that I've used for the background. Here. So, do we have any questions? Stuart. So, I'm curious if you have any experience um, yourself or just with the team. Yeah, so I have. I've used um, Bower Asset. Um, so what, what that does is it's a composer plugin that supports, you know, in the section where I had the folders where you put the type, and we had like Drupal Core in this folder, where you can actually put Bower packages in there. So, for example, if you're using the drop zone module on Drupal.org, it requires drop zone JS um, JavaScript library, and that's obviously not PHP. You can use this, um, and there's a session from uh, Wolfgang Zeigler from, I want to say, Drupal Camp Austria, um, but Fargo, F-A-G-O, if you search for that, you find his slides and he talks about how to do that. However, there is a bug in that Composer plugin, and so you need to change your tooling to run Composer install twice, 
because the first time you install it, it doesn't know about the plugin, and then once you install it, it does. You know what I mean? It's a chicken and egg scenario. There's an open issue for it in their GitHub tracker. Um, but for things like Dropzone.js, where you need a JavaScript library and you don't want to check that in because it is third-party code, it's, it's handy. Um, one thing I didn't mention is you can have a scripts uh, top-level entry in your Composer.json, and if you are using things like Dropzone.js, and if you're using any third-party um, plugins like that, you should always check what you get in that tarball. There is a um, public service announcement from the security team from 2012 around this, but it's still very valid. For example, if you use Plupload, people are familiar with Plupload, it's like a plugin for uploading files. The second you install that on your site, you open up remote PHP execution because in one of the folders that comes with that, it's got like a sample file and that sample file has in the JavaScript the configuration to, um, it sends in the payload what file extensions you're allowed to use and so if you just edit the DOM, you can upload PHP. So you should always, when you install any of those third-party um, JavaScript libraries, you should always have a look what's inside it. Um, and so if you're doing it this way, you should always have a scripts and there is one in Drupal Core that does this for most of the vendor packages. So, for example, it goes through and cleans out all of the test stuff from Mink and VHAT and PHP. I mean, if you're using Composer properly, all of that should be outside your doc root anyway, not publicly accessible from the web, but the fact of the matter is a lot of people download Drupal from uh, the tarball, and that goes straight onto their doc root and all the vendor codes in their doc root. So, yeah, if you're using those third-party libraries, I can't stress enough, make sure you check what you get in there, because you probably only need, like, one min.js file, and the rest of it is, like, their tests and their samples and their demos, delete all those. And if you're using Composer to manage that, make sure you have a script that deletes all that crap after it's installed. Yeah. Hey. Yeah, what's your opinion on using running Composer on the production environment? Uh, I would prefer that, well, we would, the way we use it is we use it on Jenkins runs it. So we deploy with, say, Capstrano, or we actually build a container that has the code in it, and then we deploy that. Uh, we don't need Composer on production. Um, but I think, I think that, so the, what you should be aiming for is to have nothing checked in and a deployment process that uses Composer to package and deploy you know, in a repeatable fashion because you've got your lock file. Yeah. Cool. Hey. Um, do you have any advice or experience setting up Composer in an offline environment? No. Um, we had, what's the proxy? Is it um, Torrent? Torrent? Yeah. You had some experience with that though, right? I was like, okay, right. Yeah. No, we, we did um, look into it. I think Gibrand probably, you know, Gibrand Ijaz is around. Um, if you want, I'll introduce you to him, but he did a fair bit of research into it, and maybe Nick as well, because um, there is like some latency, and, and particularly if you know, you've got a lot of Jenkins builds, for example, that are downloading the internet every time they have got a build. You know, it, if you've got a local mirror type thing through Torrent. Yeah, but there's all docs on how to do that. Um, and I realise some people are, are behind firewalls and stuff, so they have to do that. Yeah. Another way, cheap way to get around it using containers, for example, is you can volume in your composer case from a host and share that composer case between builds. Yeah, and that's what... That's uh, a cheap way to get around how to use Yeah, and that's what ben, Ben's doing with CircleCI. He's, he's um, to speed up the build process for, like, test runs and stuff. I think most, you know, a large part of your build process is still in NPM and all those dependencies. So if you can bring them from a cache, yeah. yeah. Hey. Uh, is there anything that I can run locally to speed up Composer? Because when I run Composer install, I'm going to make a copy and come back and install. Uh, do you have Xdebug enabled? Possibly, yes. Yeah, so you should disable Xdebug, and there's a whole documentation section on the Composer website around that. Um, if you're using, if, if Composer install is the slow one, there's a plugin called Pretissimo, I think. Uh, Prestissimo. Prestissimo, there you go, not bad. <laughs> and it, it actually does parallel fetching, because install it's all fetching, right? There's no resolving. Um, Composer update is the one where it builds a big um, dependency graph, and that's always going to be slow. But there was a recent, um, someone did some profiling and found some wins for it, and so that, if you make sure you've got the latest version. But yeah, Xdebug's the big one, because, you know, it's a lot of crap you don't need. And the docs on the Composer website show you how to like write an alias so that when you run Composer, what it actually does is like disables the PHP, uh, sorry, the Xdebug extension, runs the stuff and then reinstates it. Yeah. Isn't it just the Xdebug CLI though? Like you can still Xdebug and just disable the CLI. What, did everyone hear what he said then? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah, that's correct. Cool. Thanks, everyone.